and Lucy is from James Cook University and her talk is on Framing the Climate Emergency, World Heritage Governance and Beyond. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thanks, Alana. Just put this up. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy Holmes McHugh. I'm doing my PhD at JCU in Townsville, and I'm about two years in. The topic of my research is framing the climate emergency in world heritage governance and beyond. Today I'll be focusing on the political dimensions of climate change and specifically about the shift in climate change framing from a risk, which is something that might happen in the future, to a crisis or emergency, which is an urgent threat that demands action in the present. Over the last decade, we've seen a growth in the climate crisis and climate emergency frames. These terms were originally used by climate activist groups, but have now spread into mainstream discourse. Last year in particular, climate emergency really rose to prominence. The Oxford Dictionary declared climate emergency word of the year for 2019. Some media outlets began to use climate crisis terminology there was a high profile climate emergency letter published in Bioscience that was signed by thousands of scientists from around the world. And more and more governments are making the climate emergency declaration. So it's clear we're entering a new phase of climate change framing, but the question remains about what kind of impact it might have on climate action. And that's what I'll be discussing today. First, I'll be explaining some core definitions and theory that underpin my analysis. Then I'll discuss two key findings from my literature review, one related to emergency policy pathways and the other focusing on emergency governance characteristics. Finally, I'll touch on some findings from my research into world heritage governance. Understanding climate risk has been a core aspect of climate change as an issue. Risk refers to understanding the probability of future events. These events can be positive or negative. But now it is also important to understand the meaning of crisis and emergency. Crisis and emergency have a range of definitions in the literature, but their core aspects relate to urgency in the present, uncertainty because usually the situation is not considered to be normal, and the presence of threat or danger. There's no real semantic difference between the terms crisis and emergency, but what I found was that the concept of crisis has a much broader usage across the literature, whereas the use of emergency tends to be limited to more biophysical phenomena like medical emergencies and disasters. And it's important to note that whether something is a crisis or emergency, it's really a social interpretation of events. If we want to understand what a climate emergency means, we need to look at the processes that underpin identifying, contesting, and evaluating emergency. Framing theory is useful for this. Framing is defined as how actors understand the cause of a problem, who is responsible for it, and what the solutions are. How issues are framed affects individual perceptions, collective definitions, Framing is also a strategy to shape policy and governance. My focus is on policy and governance. Policy refers to a specific course of action taken by organisations, and governance refers to the processes and actors involved in decision making. This is an example of media framing of coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef. The first article says that it's horrific and a crisis or the other one says that it's better than expected. So you can see that framing plays an important role in how ecological events are interpreted. Now we've covered some of the key concepts in theory, I'll discuss the findings from my literature review. The purpose of the review was to understand both the opportunities and challenges that the climate emergency frame might pose for policy and governance. 
I used a critical review methodology. First, I looked broadly at risk, crisis, and emergency concepts across the literature. I then focused more narrowly on crisis governance and policy literature. From the review, I developed a diagram highlighting the different political interpretations of emergency and how this might affect policy. I'll now talk you through it. First, we start with the social ecological system that produces climate related events like coral bleaching, for example. The next stage is where actors like governments will interpret and frame these events. In the first policy pathway, actors do not perceive any emergency. This means they do not place political blame on anyone and support the status quo. They will not seek any policy change. In the second pathway, actors do not perceive a current emergency, but anticipate climate risk in the future. Political blame may be limited to enable bipartisan approaches to support risk-based policy change. In the next pathway, actors perceive an emergency as a threat to political or policy preferences. In this instance, actors seek to diffuse blame and defend the status quo. Actors may frame placebo policy as a solution. Placebo policy refers to policy that does not address the cause of an issue, but is a response to political pressure that allows the actor to maintain their existing policy preferences. In the final pathway, actors perceive emergency as an opportunity for political and policy change. They focus blame to change the status quo. They use treatment policy to address the underlying causes of climate events. And from these pathways, the effect of policy will feed back into the social ecological system. What this diagram highlights is that there are multiple political interpretations of emergency framing that can affect policy outcomes. The next findings from the review relate to the characteristics of emergency governance. These are general characteristics, not specific to climate change. So you might recognize some governance parallels with the coronavirus response. The characteristics of emergency governance can be grouped into three dimensions, context, actors, and decisions. In the context of emergency governance, we could expect to see high issue salience in media and society. The circumstances are not considered normal. There is a recognition of threat. There are usually dominant narratives that support the emergency framing, which can marginalize alternative views. There will also be high political pressure for action and less focus on other issues. The actors involved in governance usually change as well. There is more bipartisanship, at least initially. There's a smaller, more powerful group of key decision makers. We see power shifts in policy subsystems. Some actors become more powerful and others lose power. And we also usually see executive powers increase relative to the legislature. Finally, when it comes to the decisions, typically they're characterized by speed and urgency. Policies may be more radical and far reaching and involve large resource allocations. There's usually less scrutiny of decisions, at least initially. And even when decisions are supposed to be temporary, they can often leave legacies. This analysis highlights that emergency governance may offer opportunities for large scale change, but that governance systems may also be more concentrated and exclusive. Now I'm going to discuss some preliminary findings into World Heritage Governance. You can see all the dots on the map are World Heritage Sites. These World Heritage Sites are under more obligations to protect and conserve their sites for future generations. The red dots are World Heritage Sites that have been put on the endangered listing. If a site is put on the endangered listing, it signals that the site is under threat and needs more effort to be protected, both from the country in which it is located, but also by the international community. <laughs> 
The endangered list is essentially a way to frame an ecosystem emergency. I use an event ethnography method to research world heritage governance. This means applying ethnographic techniques to events like observation and participation to understand how different actors try to influence framing at these meetings. Last year, I went to the World Heritage Meeting in Azerbaijan, where there was contention over whether climate change should be a reason for an endangered listing. At the meeting, the Australian government delegate said that climate change should not be a reason for endangered listing because of its global impact. However, some NGOs disagree, saying the endangered listing would be a powerful political message to encourage governments like Australia to take more action on climate change. The outcome of this ongoing policy debate will have implications for whether the Great Barrier Reef could be put on the endanger listing due to the threat from climate change, and this will have political ramifications. The next stages of my research will be doing a framing analysis of climate change and making a documentary as a visual method to explore climate change in international relations. In conclusion, climate emergency framing can be politically powerful more political pressure could pave the way for large scale urgent action. But the challenge is that governments might also resort to placebo policy and constrain government structures can marginalize the less powerful and reduce scope for debate and oversight. So the question is how can emergency framing be steered in a way that improves climate and conservation outcomes? Thank you.